Hello guys, welcome back. We're going to start talking about supply now. We just finished talking about demand, so we'll now do the other half of the graph, supply. So remember the typical graph that we're going to be drawing lots and lots of will look like this, with a downward sloping demand curve and an upward sloping supply curve. So today in this video we're going to focus on supply. So remember that supply is going to be a schedule, which will give us a curve. So at any particular price, there will be different quantities supplied. So we have different prices here, maybe $1, $2, and $4, and that is going to result in various quantities supplied. So if I'm running an ice cream stand and I can sell a, uh, an ice cream cone for a dollar, then, you know, that's fine. So maybe I'll stand out there in the heat and I'll sell 50 ice cream cones. Now, if I can get a price of two dollars, well I'm going to be a lot more interested in standing out in the heat if I can get two dollars per cone. For the time being, just sort of ignore demand. Don't. Some guys are tempted to say, well, nobody's going to want to buy a two dollar ice cream cone, and that very well might be true. We're just putting all of those to the side. Then obviously, if I could sell you know, uh, my ice cream cones for four dollars, that's like massive amounts of profit. So, you know, then maybe I'll stay out there and I'll sell 300 different cones of, of delicious ice cream on a hot day. Now, um, what the supply, what supply really is, is the amount producers are willing and able to sell at any given price. That goes down to the individual supply, which is what one particular ice cream salesman would supply. But then obviously you can imagine if ice cream cones are getting $4 each, then everybody is going to want to sell ice cream and there's going to be all kinds of players in that market, lots and lots of people. So the law of supply, just like we have a law of demand, is very particular. So other things equal, ceteris paribus, as the price rises, the quantity supplied rises. And as the price falls, the quantity supplied falls. Remember, we're talking about quantity supplied. We're not talking about supply. So supply is this one curve. It's the whole curve. Whereas quantity supplied is any particular point on that existing curve. Now, the reason that this happens is that price is an incentive to producers. As the price rises, that incentivizes them to sell more. Because especially when all things are equal and costs are not yet rising, they're making a greater and greater and greater amount of profit as the price goes up. Now, clearly, when costs start to rise, that's a whole different deal that we'll get to later on. But remember the law of supply. There's usually a, a question on either the law of supply or the law of demand. So what you see now is a schedule, okay, where you have at different prices, suppliers are willing to supply different amounts. So if I can get $5 per bushel, then I'm going to sell a lot more bushels per week than if I can just get $1 per bushel. And that's what gives me the upsloping supply curve. Now, what might cause a change in supply? So not a change in quantity supplied. The thing that causes a change in quantity supplied is a change in, oops, the thing that causes a change in quantity supplied is a change in the price. So if we go from the price of $2 per bushel to $3 per bushel, then I'm going to supply more. So that is movement along the existing supply curve. That's a change in quantity supplied, or what I will typically refer to as Q sub S, as opposed to a change in supply. A change in supply, that's where you have a shift of an entire curve. So an increase looks like a rightward shift, and a decrease looks like a leftward shift. Remember, please do not say that supply goes up. Say that supply increases or shifts to the right. We can't say supply goes up because that becomes very confusing since obviously S2, which reflects an increase in supply looks like it is sort of graphically below S1, and that gets guys very confused. So we have decreases in supply, which look like leftward shifts, and we have increases in supply, which look like rightward shifts. Now, just like with demand, where we had uh, increases, or I'm sorry, where we had determinants of demand, we also have determinants of supply. 
Oh, I forgot to talk about that. So once again, you see on this, if we are moving from, from this point to this point, then that's a change in quantity supplied. But when we move from S1 to S3 or S1 to S2, that's a change in supply. All right, now back to my determinants. So when resource prices change, so let's say now resource prices are the things that go into making something. So a resource of ice cream is milk. If milk becomes less expensive, then ice cream makers will have an easier time making ice cream, and that cheaper milk means that there will be an increase in supply. Technology really only goes in one direction, so technology only improves things. Technology will always cause an increase in supply. It's kind of inconceivable that a technology could cause a decrease in supply, because then we would just ignore that bad technological development. So, so that really only pushes us to the right. A change in the number of sellers. So this can be an increase or decrease in the number of sellers. Like I was saying, if you know, you're getting four dollars per ice cream cone, then everybody would be diving into that market. But if you could only get 50 cents per cone, then pretty much everybody's going to leave. So when we have people leaving the market, then that's going to look like a leftward shift of supply as we move from S to S1 because there are so many fewer people out there in the market selling. Taxes are subsidies, so obviously taxes will cause decreases in supply. Subsidies will cause increases in supply. Subsidy can be viewed as a, the opposite of a tax or a negative tax. The change in the price of other goods. So let's say I am, you know, a, a, I have a dairy company and I can choose to either make ice cream or I can make cheese. Well, if cheese all of a sudden is getting a whole lot more, a, a whole lot higher price, it's more profitable for me to make cheese, then I'm going to take some amount of my, um, of my factory and I'm going to dedicate it to cheese rather than ice cream, which is going to decrease the supply of ice cream. However, on the other hand, if the price of cheese falls, then I'm going to go from S2 I'm sorry, S1 all the way to S2 when the price of cheese falls. And then finally, a change in producer expectations. So we saw a similar uh, thing to this when we were looking at demand, but if, if uh, producers believe that the prices are going to change in the future, then they will behave accordingly. So, um, you know, if they believe that prices are going to go up, then they'll start producing more today. Um, you know, that, that sort of thing. Nothing new there. So here's another really good chart. This is a great study tool for you. Pay attention. You've got your list of determinants, and then you have your list of examples of those determinants. You have the same look and thing in demand, and I really recommend that you pay good attention to those two. Now, equilibrium, you've already seen this. We've already talked about it, but now we have our downsloping supply and our upsloping demand. I'm sorry, our up downsloping demand and upsloping supply. I just made the cardinal sin of, of, uh, of economics. Downsloping demand, upsloping supply. The intersection of the two, that is what we call the market clearing price or the equilibrium. This is the price at which demanders and sellers, suppliers, agree. And we have no surplus and no shortage. At this price, everybody you know, the suppliers want to supply this quantity, and the demanders want to demand that quantity. Okay, so everything that is supplied is demanded. There is no extra, and there is no shortage. The price does what we call this, this rationing function, and it gives us efficient allocation. If prices are too high, then people will make fewer of them, or buy fewer of them. Um, if prices are low, then they're going to have to produce more because people are going to demand it, and the, the market will just sort of work things out. Now you can imagine, if prices are high for some reason, so we have a really high price, then that's going to have a lot of suppliers, but fewer quantity demanded. So quantity supply is higher than quantity demand, and we call this a surplus. It's when there is extra, okay? So that surplus means that we have essentially too much. Now what's eventually going to happen is the price will fall.
because the suppliers don't want to be stuck with the extra stuff. So they will lower the price and then demanders who always wanted it at a lower price. They don't want it more because the price went down. They always wanted it at that price. Now they're going to bring us back into equilibrium. Okay, so you can imagine, as Adam Smith said, an invisible hand pushing that price down. This leads to an efficient allocation of resources. So as we talked about, every business must produce at the lowest cost possible. That means that they're productively efficient. If they don't produce at the lowest cost possible, somebody else will, and then they'll be driven out of business. It's also what we call allocatively efficient because we will have the right mix of resources. So we're going to have the right amount of ice cream versus cheese based on how these prices work. And we'll go more into productive and allocative efficiency later on. So you'll notice now, if we wind up in a situation up here, then we have a surplus. Down here, we have a shortage. And you can see how this works on all of these, uh, on all these charts. So we'll move past that. So the ability of the competitive forces of demand and supply to establish a price at which selling and buying decisions are consistent. That's just that idea of the invisible hand pushing up when prices are too low, pushing down when prices are too high, and giving us that nice equilibrium in the middle. And we already went through this, so here's nice, prettier definitions. You can pause and write those down if you'd like. And now let's look at our changes in demand and equilibrium. So when we have a shift in demand, that increase in demand gives us a new intersection on the supply curve. Okay, so what that winds up doing is giving us a change in quantity supplied. So an increase in demand, a rightward shift of demand, gives us a change in quantity supplied. Okay, so when what I often hear students say is when demand shifts, supply has to shift because you need more stuff to satisfy all the extra demand. That's not actually true. Supply remains the same, but quantity supplied changes. So you'll notice that that increase in demand raises the price that increase in price then is the incentive for suppliers to supply more. And we move from Q to Q1. So there is more stuff being supplied, but it is not a shift in supply. It is a change in quantity supplied. So remember, when there's a rightward shift in demand, we have a, both an increase in, in price and an increase in quantity. Then when we have a decrease in demand, what you'll see is a decrease in price and a decrease in quantity. So that leftward shift of demand pushes our quantity down, or pushes our price down, and pushes our quantity down. You can tell if you're a business and the demand for your product falls, that's a bad situation because you're going to sell fewer items at a lower price. So that's kind of the worst case scenario. Here, when demand goes up, you're going to sell more at a higher price. That's kind of the ideal situation. Now on the supply side, when supply shifts, so maybe technology happens or maybe you know something else, supply shifts to the right, the price falls, but quantity goes up. Now we're going to talk later on about whether you end up making more total revenue this way, but this is generally viewed as a good thing. Producers are willing and able to sell more at lower prices they generally view that as a good thing. There's a couple of, of exceptions that we'll talk about later. Then, when you have a decrease in supply, you are going to sell fewer items at a higher price. So both of these can have increases or decreases in total revenue based upon what we call elasticity of demand, which we'll get to in chapter four. It's a more complicated subject, but you can probably imagine if the uh, amount that you sell the lower amount that you sell more than outweighs the extra that you're getting per unit, then this is a bad thing for you. Okay. Whereas over here, theoretically, you could sell so many more units that even though the price is lower, you still wind up making more money.
then we have these complex cases. So this I just want you to take a look at. We will not have these. We don't do, in AP Economics, we don't do simultaneous shifts of supply and demand. There will always be one or the other. And you can see these indeterminants are the reason. You can't predict when there's a double shift necessarily what's going to happen. So sometimes there will be a question that would say something like, if supply and demand both increase, then what do we know will happen? And the answer would be, we know that the equilibrium quantity will increase, but we're not sure about the price. So basically, filling out this chart one year was an AP uh, multiple choice question, but it's relatively unusual. Now, the next thing that we'll discuss are what we call price ceilings or price floors. These are situations where the government sets prices. They're pretty rare in the United States. We don't do them very often, um, and you'll see why in a moment. So in a price ceiling, that means that the price is set below the equilibrium price. It is a cap that you're not allowed to charge more than a certain amount. What's going to happen is black markets will develop. So here's an example. Does anybody recognize this? Take a look at it. Pause and think about it. This is the apartment from Friends. This is how Monica and Rachel are living in Manhattan. If you know anything about Manhattan real estate, you know that it is very expensive. And you know, if you pay attention to the show, that she was a, that Monica was a chef and uh, Rachel was a sort of unemployed coffee shop worker. So clearly they should not be able to afford this beautiful two-bedroom uh, apartment with a balcony on their salaries. So is this just television being crazy? Or is there something else going on? Believe it or not, there's something else going on. New York City has something called rent control, which basically, long and short of it means, once you move into the apartment, if it's a rent-controlled apartment, the landlord cannot raise the price on you. And this was what's called an illegal sublet from Monica's great-aunt, who had died long ago. But she basically moved into this apartment after World War II when everything was really cheap, and they're still paying the same rent from the 1940s or 50s or whenever her great-aunt moved in there. So it is not an example of unrealistic TV. It's an example of economics at work and the development of a black market with these illegal sublets. Okay? So let's see what that looks like graphically. You can imagine here if the ceiling is set too low. Okay, so if, if, you know, that apartment is set at $300 rather than $3,500 like it should be, then very few people are going to be interested in supplying those apartments for rent, but everybody's going to want to live in them. So there will be a shortage of those apartments. Okay? A price floor is the opposite. This is where prices are set above the market price. And then we're going to have chronic surpluses. So one example could be a minimum wage law. Let's look at that graphically. So now we see that um, if people are willing to work for this low wage down here, say $2 per hour, but the government sets a minimum wage of $3 per hour, then... Um, Supply of workers is going to be really high. Everybody wants that job, but demand for workers is going to be relatively low. So in the end, fewer people will be employed. The people who are employed will make more money. It's good for them. But all of these people will not be employed at all. They won't make any money. And you could imagine that that could be viewed as a bad thing. So if you want to go into a discussion about this, there's actually a Freakonomics podcast about um, the person who I believe won the Nobel Prize for coming up with um, how you can sort of economically figure out how UNOS works, which is the human organ um, platform that, that organs are traded upon, not sold or anything, but, but traded. Um, there's a very interesting Freakonomics about that, and the book does a pretty good job at the end of the chapter. So take a look at that if you'd like. That's all we got. Next, we're going to study international trade. Thanks for listening, guys.